Because this is, today's topic is something that I am very passionate about. And so I might get a little loud. I might get a little excited. I might get a little challenging. So you feel free to see me after the service today and you can call me out and you can say, hey man, you got to calm down just a little bit. We can't be having all that excitement up in here. But you'll see on your notes right there to start with, where we are beginning is we are looking at some things. And so those of you who are participating with me this morning, and I always encourage you to do this, you'll see you have a chart across the top and it says two sins, two issues, one person. What I want you to do is I want you to think about two sins, two different types of sins, if you will, or actions or something like that, that really, really get on your nerves or bother you or you can't stand the fact that that's a sin in the world today or that's probably the worst thing anybody could do. You could just jot that down real quick. Now, some of you biblically smarty pants, you're going to put something down there, uh, you know, the worst sin, and you're going to quote Scripture, and that's perfectly fine because it's in there. Jesus does tell us the absolute worst sin. But what we want to do, if you're going to put that down, if you're going to quote that, some of you are looking at me like you don't know. It's okay if you don't know. We'll talk about it in a minute. But if you're going to put that one down and you're going to quote Jesus for that, I want you to challenge yourself to explain what in the world that even looks like because a lot of people don't even understand what that means. So let's just think of two sins, two issues that really, really bother you. Two sins that really bother you. And then let's go with two major problems that you see in the world today. What are two things going on in the world today that are problems, that are issues? So we're identifying two, two different sins. We're looking at two different sins that when we see those, they almost make us, you know, get, get, get a little antsy, get a little tightened up on the inside or something like that. And then we're looking at two issues that could even be related, guys. They could be related. We're looking at two issues, two things we know 100% are wrong with the world today. And in that last column where it says one person, I want you to write the name or put initials of one person that you do not 100% know is a believer. Okay, so it's just one person that you're not certain if they're a believer or not a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to say not a Christian because sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we're not certain if people are believers in Christ or not. So there's your beginning point. And as you're finishing that up, I will tell you that we're beginning a new series and it's called Power in the Parables. And the parables are the messages and the stories that Jesus used quite frequently in His teachings. And so we need to make certain that we've got this understanding right here. And we talk about it a lot at different times. I think most of us know that, but I put it here just in case. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What that looks like is Jesus is telling things using stuff of the earth. But when you peel that back and look at it a bit deeper, you begin to realize that it is very powerful in what he is teaching us about heaven, what he is teaching us about believers, what he is teaching us about what you and I and we should be doing. OK, so Jesus uses these earthly stories that have heavenly meanings. And today we're going to look at a particular passage and you can go ahead. Those of you with your Bibles, you can go ahead and find this passage. We're going to be over in the Gospel of Matthew and we're going to be looking in chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Now, those of you that didn't bring your Bibles with you, don't have it on your device, I did put it on the sheet, so you do have reference to it. Remember, there is always power in reading God's Word. There's always power in reading God's Word. So today's message that we're focusing in on, the parable that we're looking at, deals with growing with weeds. Now, I told these children a little bit earlier that we had some individuals in here that grew up on a farm or around the farm. Can I verify that? Anybody grow up on a farm, around a farm, been around a farm, worked on a farm, any of that? Okay, good deal. Thank you all very much. Now, you know, one of the worst things for a farmer is weeds. The weeds are one of the worst things that can happen to anyone who farms and works on a farm. And here we're going to look at this passage 
This parable that Jesus tells, which specifically talks about the weeds. So we're in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. Let's read it together. It says, here's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. Verse 27, the farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Well, should we pull the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest, and then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them in a bundle, and burn them. And we will put the wheat in the barn. Now, several of you read your Bibles and you go through these passages, and sometimes we have, we, we, we have a way of just kind of reading things in the Bible, and we just read them and we just keep moving on. But I assure you, this is a very powerful passage and parable that Jesus is using to talk to these people. But guess what? Quick check. How many of you have ever read something in the Bible and you don't understand what it means? I will raise both my hands on that, okay? All right? Even some of these parables sometimes. You know that there are people who will dedicate their entire lives to researching just one parable, to becoming experts on one parable, trying to unlock what it was that Jesus actually meant. There are some individuals that will do that. And I by no means claim to be an expert, but I do think that this morning I can share with you some of the things that I believe Jesus was trying to teach. And for all of us who raised our hands saying, there are times when I read things in my Bible and I don't understand, guess what? The disciples that were with Jesus all the time, there were a lot of times Jesus taught things and they didn't understand themselves. There were a lot of times when Jesus did things right in front of them and they didn't understand themselves. They had short-term memory loss, if you will, like a lot of us. There were miracle after miracles that Jesus did that were so similar, but you read through these Gospels and at times it's like, did these disciples not pay attention the last time the people were hungry and Jesus fed them? Or did the disciples not remember the last time Jesus calmed the storm? Do the disciples not remember that this is who Jesus is and what Jesus does? And it's easy whenever I'm looking in the Word of God and I'm reading somebody else's deficiencies or faults or flaws. What's hard is whenever I'm staring in the mirror and I forget that I forget sometimes the power of God, the ability of God, the strength of God, the love of God. The blessings of God. So what can we really take away this morning from this parable of the weeds? Or for some of you in your Bibles, it may have the header there. Some of them say the parable of the weeds. Some of them say the weeds and the seeds. Some of them say the parable of the wheat and the tares. Some translations have the, the wheat and the thorns. It all means the same thing. Can we agree that what we've got going on is we've got a farmer... We don't know a whole lot about the farmer except he's doing his job farming. And he's got his workers and they are planting wheat. And they do their job the way that they're supposed to do their job. But the result that they get is not what they expect. And this is what Jesus is teaching us, if you will. Point number one is you cannot expect everyone to do what is right. That almost seems like a no-duh statement, doesn't it? That almost seems like, seriously? But you know what? There are a lot of times when we get frustrated and we get angry and we get upset because people don't do the right thing. 
I do. I get upset. I get frustrated because people don't do the right thing. But what we learn inside of this passage, inside of this parable, particularly in verse 25, is it's not just about people who don't do the right thing. In verse 25, we learn that at nighttime, while this farmer and while his workers were asleep, his enemy decides to come to his field and intentionally plants these weeds. You follow with me? There are people that are intentionally trying to bring you down. There are people that will always try to stop the word of God from being spread. So we learn that we can't expect everyone to do what is right. Along with this, we've got some individuals that play that long game. They're setting these traps for us to fall into. we got some experts who will try and reel us in. And sometimes these traps happen pretty quickly. Sometimes these traps do take a long time. I was just going through the Bible and just looking at different individuals. And that really seems to be the way that temptation usually works, right? Matter of fact, in another part of the Bible, it kind of compares it to this. That first the seed of temptation is planted and then later on it comes to fruition. So you want to see how this works? We can go all the way back to the beginning because the reality is that whenever God created the world, He created it to be good. God deemed it good when He created it. But the world that I'm living in right now in the year 2022 is not a good world. Why not? Because the enemy, the adversary, has intentionally come in and planted weeds in the garden. We go back and we can see the first encounter that the adversary, the devil, Satan, has with Eve and Adam. And we see that that was a trap. That was a setup. That was a play on words. And they lost that particular battle. And then at that particular moment, the sin was planted and the weeds began to bloom. You go on up in the Bible, you can find Delilah. She set a trap for my guy, Samson. Now, Samson, super strong. We all know that. But apparently, Samson was not the smartest man in the world. Because boy, he couldn't see it coming. Now again, this is one of those situations where we're the outsiders and we can say, man, this is not going to end well. You watch those movies, you read those books, you see these things, you talk to different people and you can realize, you can say, this is not going to end very well. But the person that's in in that particular moment, they can't see it, can they? And we've all truthfully been in those situations before. When we look back, we say, man, if I'd have only paid attention to all those warning lights that were going on. My guy Samson, he just falls further and further and further and further into the trap and ultimately it cost him. Let's keep going. How about there's a guy, we we did a message on it, Pastor Glenn did a message on it um, several months ago about Mordecai and this man by the name of Haman. He set this entire trap to get rid of all the Jews. Plot twist, his own trap came back and got him. Other individuals, we can move to the New Testament. This stuff just doesn't happen in the Old Testament, right? Sometimes individuals believe, well, that's just Old Testament. That's just the Old Testament. Let me tell you something. You can learn a lot from the Old Testament, okay? Jesus taught from the Old Testament. So if Jesus valued the Old Testament, I'm pretty sure that we should value what's in there as well. But you can learn that these individuals tempted and set traps for Jesus, didn't they? The Pharisees. The Sadducees, they would try to set these traps for Jesus. Not only that, but yours and my greatest adversary for those who are believers, the devil, attempts to set traps for Jesus as well. The same thing he did in the very beginning, twisting words, trying to get Adam and Eve to follow what his advice was and reinterpreting the scripture in his way to fit his message. They believe it. They fall into sin. He shows up again in this New Testament and tries to do the same thing with Jesus. But because Jesus knew The Word of God was the Word of God, if you will. It doesn't work. 
But the illustration is there is an enemy that is intentionally trying to disrupt and destroy the good things that we do for Christ. So we can't expect everyone to do what is right. You want to know another expectation? Another thing that we have to realize is God didn't, God never ever intended for any of us to ever suffer, to experience pain. Originally, as far as we know, based on what we have, God did not plan for people to die. But it's because of those weeds that came into that perfect garden, death came. And then the people were so bad and so evil. If you go again, you go back in the Old Testament, people used to live several hundred years. But because those weeds just grew so much, God says, that's enough. I can't just let people keep doing what's wrong. And he caps it off. But all of that death, all of that sickness, all of that suffering, all of that heartache, the things that we go through, those weeds that we encounter, are not God's plan. They weren't God planning it there. It was the adversary, the enemy, sneaking in and planting these weeds. And God said, I must deal with it. And as we continue, what else can we learn? We can learn from this particular passage that you can expect to be surrounded by both weeds and wheat. Now, in this parable, whenever we interpret it, we see that the weeds obviously are the sins and the sinners and the wheat is what was wanted. It was what was desired. So we ourselves, those who are believers, those who are Christians, are the wheat. Now, it can feel at times like I am the only piece of wheat standing in the field being choked out by a bunch of weeds. Ever had that feeling before? In other words, I am the only person doing what is right. I am the only person believing in God. I am the only person making a stand. It can be very easy to find ourselves in those situations, but I assure you that we learn that there are other individuals, other pieces of wheat grown in the field. An interesting thing about this is this enemy comes in and plants weeds he doesn't come in and dig up all of the wheat, does he? See what I'm saying right there? The enemy can't mess with the wheat. Because the wheat, that's God's chosen. So the enemy can't come in and mess with you without the permission of the Father. And all he can really do is plant all these weeds around you when weeds manifest in the problems that we have, in the situations we find ourselves in, and hello, the people that come into our lives. Anybody got some people that you'd consider to be a weed in this scenario? Boy, I can make you a list. But you know what? At some point, I'm pretty sure I was a weed to them. Some point, I'm pretty sure I was. Now, when, when we've got these weeds and we've got this wheat right here, I, I, I'm not a farmer. I grew up picking beans and things like that. Thanks, Mom. Uh, I grew up having to do all that. That was horrible experiences, man. It didn't matter what you wore. As early as you had to get there, you get soaking wet. And that's just a, a, a feeling that if you've never done it, then you just go ahead and do it, man. You go ahead and do it. And if you enjoy it and you love it, then you go keep doing that. I'm going I'm to say great job. But to me, not being a farmer, I'm kind of like these workers right here. When all this stuff starts to pop up, it's pretty quick. We can really look at it and we can say, that's wheat. That's a weed. Right? So, so to me, I, I'd be like, let's get rid of these weeds, man. Let's go get rid of all these weeds. And this is what the workers wanted to do. They wanted to isolate and they wanted to get the wheat all by itself. And they wanted to, you know, pull all the weeds up. And the farmer, the, the one that knows what's going on, right? The one that understands it all because you got the person that's got it all under control. And then you got all the workers, right? The workers don't always understand what's going on. These workers didn't understand. They were like me. They're running to him. Hey, man, we can get rid of these weeds today if you need us to. We'll go out there and we'll pull all these weeds. And the farmer says, hey, if you do that. You're going to disrupt and disturb the soil. And so this right here is Jesus teaching us that 
those of us who are believers, even though it'd be wonderful if we were only ever surrounded by other believers, that would be perfect, right? That would be great. That would be an excellent experience. Guess what? It's not going to happen, my friends. Not until the day that you are called home. You will not be surrounded by 100% total believers until the day that you are called home. You can expect to be surrounded by the weeds. And you say, well, how in the world do I grow while I'm surrounded by these weeds? That's the challenge. The challenge is I've got these weeds, but how in the world do I continue to grow? You've got to focus and you've got to rely upon God. Paul kind of tells us that in his writings, whenever he's, you know, transformed, we'll get to that in a second, whenever he's transformed over in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, if you want a scriptural reference, and I'm going to paraphrase, summarize right here, Paul says you must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Colossians, we, we, we read Colossians 3 and 2, it says, set your mind on things that are above, not on these earthly things. So if I'm focused on all of these weeds and all of these problems and all of these issues, then it's going to hold me back. But if I'm focused on God's word and I'm focused on the father and I'm focused on his love, I will grow. I will grow closer to God. I will rely upon the Lord in my situations, in my struggles. I will focus on him. But what about all these weeds? Do I just grow? And let all these weeds just be here? No. Because Jesus tells us and the Bible teaches us that we are called to seek justice. We're called to be advocates. We're called to do what is right and we are called to point out when things are wrong. We have to seek justice. The prophet Micah says in Micah 6, 8, and I did a sermon on it back in September, one of the things that we are told to do is to act justly. To seek that justice is what we are supposed to do. But let me tell you, that ultimate justice is not going to come until Christ returns. Those issues that you wrote down on your paper right there that you know are problems, that I know are problems, you and I are called to stand up. If you've identified that as a problem on your paper, guess what? You need to stand up and do what you can to seek justice for that. But at the same time, you have to understand that while we're seeking justice, it may not come in the way that you expect it to. But we know there is never a wrong time to do the right thing. Absolutely never a wrong time to do the right thing. The third thing that we've got to do if we really want to continue growing while we're surrounded by all of these weeds is we have to share the message of hope. What is the message of hope? It is the love of Jesus Christ. It's the love of Jesus Christ. We can't just pull all the wheat, just like the illustration shows. We can't just pull all the wheat and we can't just you know, grow all of that in one field and then just let the, the, the weeds be over there. Now, this is where that earthly passage, that earthly story doesn't make sense without the heavenly meaning. Because we all know, those of us who've ever planted anything, those of us who've ever had to deal with any type of weeds that are growing, we all know that the weeds cannot change from being a weed, right? To my knowledge. Now, somebody that's a botanist or, you know, anything like that, you could come talk to me later. But, you know, I, I don't know that a weed can transform. But the amazing thing in understanding this heavenly meaning where we're comparing Christians to wheat and we're comparing weeds to sin and sinners and unbelievers. Guess what? Jesus offers forgiveness, transformation for these weeds, these unbelievers. They can become wheat. And where do these weeds, these unbelievers hear the gospel and the message of hope? If you're thinking church, if you're thinking that they're going to stumble in through the door, you need to wake up. Because that may have been true several years ago, my friends. 
But in the world that I see in the time that we're living in right this second in 2022, the time for the sinner wandering into a church is very rare. It's very rare in America. What was shared earlier about the other country and the, the, the great change that's going on over there, that's awesome. That is amazing to re realize. You guys realize that's like a large population of people? That is massive. That is incredible. You and I have got to make certain that we share that message of hope. But here's the deal. Look on your paper right there about those two sins that you wrote down, those two things that bother you. Well, guess what? I don't know who you are, but I'm pretty sure that the Holy Spirit or Jesus or God Himself has not given you the scales of justice that tell you that those sins are far worse than any other sins and that He doesn't love that individual. The Bible is very, very adamant that God loves the sinner, not the sin. And so those sins that you wrote down, that I wrote down, that we wrote down, those are the things that Jesus died for. Let that sink in for a second. The very thing that you say is probably one of the worst things a person can do is the very thing that held Jesus up on that cross. Aside from His love. That's what held Jesus there. That very sinner that comes to mind, that very individual that causes you such grief, that weed that is in your life, do you realize that Jesus died for that person? But a lot of us don't want to be around those individuals. We're called to be in the world, not of the world. How are these people in the world ever going to see Christ unless they see Christ in me? You are the gospel. You are the gospel's hands, the gospel's feet. Let me clarify. You're not the gospel. The gospel is God's wonderful word. You are the messenger of the gospel. You are called to be the hands and the feet and the voice of of the gospel and I'm telling you my friends and you know this you can 100% believe it I can speak louder sometimes when I'm not saying a word what message are we sending to the unbelievers about the love and the unconditional love of God whenever you nor I want anything to do with them Whenever all we want to do is run there and point out their sins. And there is a time and there is a place and there is a charge and there is a command for us to do that. But Jesus never did it without love and without offering hope and restoration. The problem is, I don't want to be around weeds. I call it what it is. I just really want to be around believers. When I'm around other believers, I feel energized. It's great when I read my Bible by myself, but man, when I start talking about things that God's done in different people's lives, I get some sort of energy that I didn't realize that I didn't have. And I've got to make sure that I'm taking that energy and I'm letting these weeds see it. So that when they look at me and they say, there's something very different about you. I can then explain to them what's going on. And I can say, hey, listen, it ain't really a whole lot different than me and you, except for a couple choices. Let me tell you one of the biggest choices. And then I can go into the hope and the message of the gospel. So Jesus is telling us that these weeds are going to be here, my friends. The question is whether or not you're going to grow. And this morning as we're closing it out, I want you to just take a second and I want you to look in that column where you put the one person there. You wrote somebody's name, you wrote somebody's initials. Some of you honestly may not have written anything and you may have said, I really don't know. That's the person 
that God placed on your mind this morning. That's the person that God placed on your heart this morning. That's the person you're supposed to reach out to. If not today, this week. But especially, you've got to reach out to them. And you say, well, it's just such an awkward conversation. It can be. Oh man, 100%. There are times when I am just a little afraid or don't really know how I'm going to approach this subject or this situation or things like that. I've seen people be offended by being asked if they're a Christian before. But if you don't know, you don't know. Now asking somebody if they're a believer is not saying, hey man, do you go to church? Because <laughs> guess what? Churches are full of weeds, my friend. They're just growing up. They're looking the part. But we see when that true justice comes according to the farmer in verse number 30, and it is very real and very scary. When the harvest is taken in, the wheat will be placed in the barn, heaven. The weeds will be bundled and thrown in the fire, hell. So now I just ask my friends as we're closing out that you just close your eyes and I'm just going to give you just a moment to just call the name of the person on the list to the Lord. Where you are, right where you are. If you want to come up to the altar, you're, you're certainly welcome to come to the altar. There's power in coming forward. But I believe you can reach God wherever you are, whenever you are. Our Father, as we're just lifting these names up, you know these people. And I pray that we would be empowered to go out and, and, and chat with them. And for the ones that are Christians that claim that they're a believer in you, God, help us to form friendships with them, stronger friendships, and to learn how to grow together. For those on our list that may not be believers or may not even know if they're believers, we just know and we pray and we thank you in advance for giving us the words to say that we can deliver the message. And God, for those that we go and we ask and they, they may fuss us out, cuss us out, throw us out, whatever it may be, we thank you for that because your word tells us that when we take a step forward towards you, that enemy is going to try and pull us back. We just thank you, God. In advance, we've praised you for the things that you've done, God. We've praised you for the things that you are going to do, God. We praise you for the things that you are doing. And this morning, as we close it out, God, we just say, let us all grow closer to you and in your love. Amen.